I can't tell you what a pleasure it is for um, uh, us at the Savory Institute to have you all here and, and participating and being part of this collaborative movement, so thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure to invite a, a dear friend and, and also one of our holistic management educators up to the stage, Owen Hablutzel. Good morning. It's great to see uh, everybody coming back from break now. Uh, if we're off to a rollicking start, I think, for the conference. And I think uh, we're ready to carry on with uh, Darren Doherty here. I want to tell you a little bit about Darren. Um, I wouldn't be standing here today if it wasn't for Darren. Um, so he means a lot to me personally in my life, and I know this is true for many people around the world, and increasingly so as he's becoming more and more uh, well-traveled, well-known, along with the family. I first saw Darren in Australia in 2007 in January. I was taking a permaculture design certificate course from uh, Bill Mollison, who's a founder of permaculture, and Jeff Lawton, who's one of the better known uh, permaculture personalities in the world. Uh, Darren showed up to that course and people were whispering, there were 70 people uh, at this course, uh, people were whispering, look, that's, there's Darren Doherty, there's, there's Darren Doherty. And I, I had no clue who Darren Doherty was at this time. I was like, there's, there's a guy over there, he looks Australian, I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> well, it turned out just three months after that, Darren came to the U.S. Uh, Santa Barbara to teach a uh, key line design course. And I was uh, honored to meet him uh, more officially there, along with his entire family, because Darren is very much a family man. Um, so meeting him in the context of his whole family is really uh, to meet uh, and to know Darren. So as an introduction at that course, he, he threw us, uh, he threw me a, uh, a strange looking, uh, Ball. It was resembled the American pigskin football. If you guys he heard of this, uh, it was actually a rugby ball. I came to find out. <laughs> uh, unless I have that wrong. Um, Australian rules football. Okay, very good. <laughs> I, I stand corrected. Um, so again. Um, <clears throat> Darren threw us this ball as we introduced ourselves, and it sort of took this uh, <clears throat> in, in retrospect as, you know, he was kind of tossing us the ball, and all of us there in the class were to then run with it. So I want to invite you guys to take uh, what Darren has to say today in that spirit, as though he's tossing you an Australian rules football, and we're all going to run with it. Um, so without further ado, um, I'd like to invite all of you to enjoy um, the, the many talents <laughs> um, and the wise words of Darren Doherty. All right. Well, this is a tough gig, isn't it? Because you guys all probably know a bit more than me. Um, thank you so much, Owen. Um, it was an Australian rules football. Um, and uh, I don't know what rugby is, actually. Uh, <laughs> oh, thank you. I was waiting for that. That's called fishing. Um, yeah. That was a great course, and uh, I'm, you know, I'm really proud of Owen. Um, go to owen at gmail.com. See, I know his email off by heart, and uh, we're always farming work off to him. Uh, sometimes I farm work off to people uh, for the reason that I don't actually want it or I don't like the, like the sound of that particular client. So, um, it's, you know, if you do get an email from it that where you've been referred to by me, uh, just bear that in mind. It, it could go either way for you. Thank you. Um, what I wanted to talk about today in the half an hour that I've got, which is, believe me, for me, a, a really tight framework, um, is a philosophy that we've come up with uh, over the last couple of years. It's called Regrarianism. It's founded on the fact that, as Alan alluded to before, that agriculture is, and well, is, the most damaging activity that any species at any time has ever been involved with. We, as we enter the so-called Anthropocene, 
what we've got now is a species which is the major geological force on the planet, and that's never happened before. It's always been tectonics or, or volcanism or, or sedimentary movement by geology that's been the major force of geol geology, and now that's changed. It's, the, it's us. We move more sediment than nature moves. That's pretty, that's pretty powerful stuff. And when we hear, like Alan did before, said before, about uh, that we you know, move seven or ten tonnes of soil for every half a tonne of food that we produce, that's clearly not going in a regenerative way. So let's, let's move on from that. First thing we need to look at is our context, um, because that's where we spring from. And our primary directive as regrarians or regenerative agrarians, which we never have been, is the regenerative enhancement of the biosphere's ecosystem processes. Our secondary directive is to, the, to provide the potential for, for people to be informed about the regenerative economy. So that's the framework from which we spring. And we do that as well in a, in a family-oriented uh, context, as, uh, as Owen suggested. Something that we've been involved with for a long time is education. I believe that education is critical. Pedagogies are critical. And so we've, we've started up a lot of things. We started the Carbon Economy Series, the Carbon, uh, the carbon Farming Series, Keyline Design Courses, Regen Ag, and several other initiatives which have had thousands and thousands of people come along. Some of those people have been returned guests, of course. But we've had many, many events around the world and there's lots of people who've uh, gone on and, and stuck with this stuff because, as I was talking about to someone the other day, there's very little recidivism once you get into this sort of stuff. Once you get stuck into regenerative agriculture and the regenerative economy, you don't usually go back. It's, uh, it's only, it's only a one-way pathway, which is good. Something else that we're working on um, and have been influenced by is, uh, is uh, this manual, the Permaculture Designers Manual, which has got a lot of par permaculture, has a lot of parallels with the holistic management movement. Um, the founders or co-founders are of a similar vintage. Um, both come from a, well, let's just say they're fairly strong personalities, um, <laughs> which has to happen because any pioneer, whether it's, a, whether it's pioneer vegetation or pioneering people, have to be pretty tough, right? They have to have strong roots. They have to be willowy in that they have, they, they, when they bend over, they, get, they stand back up again. If they break a branch, well, then it will stick in a bit of ground and grow. They have to be, have that resilience. And uh, Bill Mollison, I think, and uh, Alan Savory are somewhat cut from the same cloth there. Now, the young man in this circle, Andrew Jeeves, was the illustrator of this um, quite a profound piece of text. And he's helping me with, uh, with, uh, with the illustration of our book, which is called The Regrarian's Handbook. And as I talked about the other night, I designed that cover. Isn't it a good cover? Um, <laughs> I think you can, um, what we're trying to do is uh, have a cover that uh, it'll be the only black book in the agriculture section of the library, so it'll stand out. No pictures, none of that sort of thing. What we need, and what, well, what, what I think that we need is to have information which cuts to the chase. I didn't want to, I mean, writing literature and reading it to get to, you know, you need a whole library full of stuff. What we wanted to do was create something that you put it in your glove box or you put it in your, in your bag or whatever, put it in the tractor even. And you just, get, when you want to know how to build a dam or a pond or whatever else, you just go to it and says, these are the steps. Because a lot of people in this space are already quite practical. And what they want to have is just, how do I go from here to here? So let's go through some of what the process is behind um, our platform, our agrarian's platform. Now, it's founded on a lot of work. I didn't teach any courses. I taught a couple of short, very short work workshops, but I didn't teach any courses for the first 10 years of my working career. I grew up on a farm in central Victoria, a mixed farm. Um, that was in our family until the mid-90s for 150-odd years. And 
my grandfather was a really big influence on me. He said uh, something like, my first lesson in ecology was, you know, Dazza, as he used to call me, this is when I was about seven, you know, Dazza, humans are just like yeast. They eat all of the sugar and then they'll die in their own shit. <laughs> that was my first ecological lesson. And um, I've sort of sprung from that, that, uh, you know, he also said, which really frames a lot of this, he said that the rural skills that I teach you now will hold you in good stead when the shit hits the fan. Because he had grown up through the economic depression of the 1930s, and so he knew what it was like to have somewhat of a societal collapse. And he could predict that this was gonna happen again. Because that's the cycles that we go through. We are those yeast and we are eating all of that sugar and things aren't going so great. But there's another way. So we focused a lot of our work in the first 10 years and continue to in getting the feedback from work, from the clients that we work with and all of the systems that we, uh, that we help to regenerate. I'm very influenced and grew up on a farm that was key line designed. Owen mentioned that before. The great Australian P.A. Yeomans, um, who wrote this great book called The Challenge of Landscape in 1958, he outlined for somewhat for the first time a, a real idea of what permanence means. What, and sort of categorised permanence. That the climate is absolutely fixed, you know. We're doing our best. It's taken about a million years of, since we first learned how to burn things that we finally got to this point where we're, you know, as a great human effort, we're potentially uh, uh, changing the climate. To change the land shape takes a lot of effort and so on it goes. To change the soil from being in a good state to a bad state takes very little time at all. Just as it doesn't take that much effort to change the soil from being in a bad state to a good state and so on. So it only stood to reason that when we developed our own philosophy from my perspective, that it was actually founded on some of Yeoman's work. Yeoman's platform was based on, on agriculture. It didn't, it didn't include people, society, or economy. And so what we did is we fused that into our particular platform, as we'll discuss. So, and that starts with climate. Now, as you can see here with my mouse, you know, these cumulus clouds and the, and the Coriolis of all of our planet, planetary current systems and our brain all have a similar pattern. They're also relatively fixed. And that extends to our belief that the climate of the mind of the human is as fixed often as the climate of your area. It's really hard to change particularly when you work with people in agriculture. Very hard nuts to crack. So let's leap, leap on from that, just, just, just keep that thought. So we will call in our framework, the climate is the rules of the game. The other thing that we look at, and I really enjoy what Alan said before, is that what we have to be is cast aside all of these petty Oh, egocentric movements into being mo a lot more collaborative. And that's something that we've been really strong about. If you've got a good tool, we'll use it. If you don't have it for a situation, we won't use it. Let's not, be, let's not bring ego to it. We just, you just use the best tool, tool for the job. And there's many, many more um, systems out there than those that I've just got listed. But there's a lot of great people doing a lot of great things, and that's what we try and integrate into the agrarian whole. We also understand that knowledge, that the direction from knowledge to confirmation through the diffusion of innovation takes some time, as uh, I found this great slide that, uh, you know, the early majority are not convinced until Ashton Kutcher t uh, does a tweet, is he here today? Um, no, unfortunately not. So we need to get uh, Ashton to retweet for us. Perhaps someone's got his uh, thing so that we can get things going because unfortunately that's where we're at. We've got way more consumers than we have producers now. And so this is a real game of trying to convince the consumers of the world that 
the fact that the agriculture of the world needs to change, not the other way around. So geography is our next piece. Now, if the climate is the rules of the game, then the geography is the board game. And for us, we're looking at proximity. So as you can see here, where are, your, where are you placed as a consumer or as a farm? You know, how, what are the populations around you? What's the psychographic of the population? What's the demographic of the population that you're surrounded by? And assess all of that. But then extend to your landscape. What are all of the relative elevations? You know, all of these different things. How can we use the mapping tools that we have of today, which are profound, to help us to design our landscapes so that they are that much more effective? And that's a part of what we do. So as I mentioned, you know, we have these amazing technologies with mapping. Ten years ago, there was no such thing as Google Earth. And look at how ubiquitous it is now. Everybody is engaged with geography like we never have been before. I can remember with delight coming to a farm back in the 90s with an aerial photo uh, enlargement and putting it on the table of a family and they would just gasp because they'd never seen their property from the air. They'd never seen all of those intricate patterns that, that weave through our beautiful planet or at least on their little piece of the planet. And it was amazing. And now, we can do it on an iPhone or a smartphone. You know, you can do all of these amazing things. We can also use military technology, such as through uh, GPS or GNSS technology, to map our properties. We've got to a point now where we can use even the uh, little $500 drones to map properties now. It's a very fast-moving space. Um, this is some of the stuff that we've done. This is one of my surveyors using a drone. He flew over a 140-acre property in uh, about half an hour and then spat out a half-metre contour map, which we then tested, and it was absolutely accurate. I mean, this is the sort of thing that... We're, this is the world that we're stepping into, and that, as a land planner, is very exciting. So water is the next thing, and the control of water is the control of life, and that was really the essence of Keyline, is that you control agriculture by, con by taking control of water, and... As an Australian, that's particularly in important in the most unreliable climate of, you know, un it's reliably unreliable, as I like to say. And it's one of the reasons why things like permaculture emerged from Australia or key line emerged from Australia. It was actually out of, it was innovation out of, ne out of need because our continent is so unreliable in its rainfall patterns. And so water is very important to all of us, even here in the UK, which, um, I mean, here in London, England, gets the same rain, actually gets less rain than where I come from in Bendigo and Victoria. Just as comes every day of the week, I think. Um, so uh, <laughs> it's quite humid. One of the things about today as well is that we, and we often focus on fossil fuels as being a negative, well, we look at them as being a positive when they make something called plastic pipe, which you might have heard of. I think it's the best use of fossil fuel. And, uh, and of course, we will be able to make it out of uh, wood gas in the future as well. But one of the great things about it is that it allows us to move this precious, precious fluid around like we never have been able to, to, to before. I mean, it's only the Romans who had legions of slaves who were able to reticulate water like we can do now. And uh, those systems, of course, are still in operation. What we can have now are basically plug and play water systems, which allows us to overcome the issues that we've had in the past where we're managing, managing in sedentary landscapes migratory animals. And now we can do that. We can actually have migratory animals on sedentary landscapes and, do, and move them with enormous flexibility. With earth moving machinery, we can place dams and ponds or whatever you want to call them up high in the landscape. And this is some of P.A. Yeoman's insights. You know, let's look at where can we put stable geography in our landscape that will forever hold water and allow us to use that magnificent thing that's free called gravity. But it still remains, as Alan pointed out before, that the humble raindrop on the bare soil is still, uh, as, as uh, 
as I often say, Osama bin Laden, who was uh, apparently alive and is apparently now dead, um, is no longer public enemy number one, and this is back on the register again. Public enemy number one has always remained the humble raindrop on bare soil. And uh, when you break down that, when you break down the anatomy of that raindrop, it is a very, very dangerous thing indeed. And it's kicked a lot of people off a lot of landscapes. Access is the next thing that we're looking at. Now, access means a lot of things, whether it's utilities or whether it's roads and tracks on farms. And one of the, one of the lessons from permaculture that we have is that uh, in the, one of the principles of permaculture is that each element should perform multiple functions. Now, that's what you might call common sense. But what we've come to a point now in our disintegrated way of working is that you only have single single-use elements, and that just doesn't make any sense. So when I build a road, a road is not just a road, it's a catchment. It actually helps me control water. In a dry landscape, I actually use it as a gutter to carry water off landscape. I did a workshop in Western Australia earlier in the year because there's so many holistic managers over there that they're not getting any runoff anymore and their ponds aren't filling. <laughs> and they said to me, what are we going to do about that? I said, well, let's look at improving your access on your farms and use the hard surface of a road as a catchment. So now they're doing that and of course now their ponds are filling so that they can reticulate water around on their properties. So there's, there's various ways that we can do this. Um, one of the ways that we do is we use what we call our simple handscape. So when everybody here has a hand, I, I hope, um, and you have a landscape, it is a landscape. These patterns do repeat and you have your main ridge, you have your crests interspaced with the saddles, then you have the primary ridges and the primary valleys in between. If you want to know where your roads are going on your property, get your pen out and start drawing up your ridges because that's the flattest parts of your landscape. Once you decide where those are, then you can reticulate right in those same corridors, all of your water services, avenues of trees, paddock subdivisions, all of these things. This is the beauty of the key line design system. Because once you start to segment your landscape in this particular way, then you really start to help control water and make getting around your property that much simpler. So and this is what we've done with this particular property, which is now, which is a 250 acre pig farm, where the pigs get moved every two days, and they turn off about 1,500 pigs a year, on all on pasture. Oh, wrong button. Um, so one of the things that we're trying to do with roads is not have roads impose themselves on the landscape, but they ha have them actually blend in which is really important because they are very dominating features. But as I said before, try and have roads so they are, they are conduits because you use them all of the time. You, you move through them, so you should have all of your services within them. And uh, then you get a lot more landscape harmony as well. As you can start to see from the diagrams as they build up in our triptychs here. So forestry, we believe so this is a, this is a, uh, um, a conference around grasslands. Well, grasslands to me are part of a forest. They're usually, in a lot of parts of the world, they're called savannas. And there are, there are grasslands in the world where there aren't any trees, but there's a lot more savannas than there are, than there are just pure grasslands, I believe. And what we've done is we've actually taken out a lot of the trees. We we're just in Kansas. And a lot of that area was savanna. And now you, you can look as far as you like and the only place that there's a tree is around an old homestead or in the towns, that's it. But that's not how it was. Tall grass prairie with trees every 50 metres. That's, a, that's just one type of forest system. There are many, many other forest systems. There's shelter belts, there's block plantations, there's avenue plantings, there's all sorts of different forest systems. We see that as the overarching th landscape theme in any agricultural landscape or production landscape. So with this as well comes the management of existing forests, um, which I've done a lot of work on, and I don't know that that's necessarily a big conversation in this space, but you know, there are a lot of parts of the world which are best suited to forest and closed forest. 
And um, so it's, it's what we use them for which is very critical and how importantly we integrate economic functioning in them. And so when the properties that we develop come along in time, they start to get a mosaic which is all reflective of the client's context and the light landscape context and the climate context that um, we start to get these properties that evolve which have got a lot of different forest systems on them as you can see. And one of the things that we're very conscious of as you know, humans of, I think at the moment, could possibly be called homo degenerus, not homo sapiens, is that what we need to have is homo regenerus who pays it forward to the new generations to come. Now that's not just in soil, but it's also in other forms of biomass such as trees. Buildings are another thing that we focus on. And it was Bill McDonough uh, the famous ecological architect who said that if we're so smart, why did it take us 5,000 years to put wheels on luggage? Now, <laughs> we could say, why did it take us so long to put wheels on a dairy or on any other farm building? Why do we continue to put so much capital into de degenerative infrastructure that gives us no flexibility, into bricks and mortar that has mostly single use and doesn't follow the animals? It's so critical, again, if we're going to have migratory species on sedentary landscapes, then we need to keep moving. And that means our buildings need to keep moving with that. And of course, there's a lower capex on doing this, which makes absolute sense. Um, this even comes down to the abattoir now. Why is it that we want to export all of the minerals off our farm instead of just exporting sunlight? We now have the technology of phosphorus recovery that our Mexican and Latin American colleagues have devised where we just simply burn bones and then burn them again with a silica like wood chips or rice hulls or something to make a soluble phosphorus so we can recover the, the, bone, the bone phosphorus and put it back on the land. You know, you can't do that. You know, the abattoirs won't give you your bones back. <laughs> Half the time they won't even give you your animal back. <laughs> You might laugh, but I know you know that, that laugh, that's, that's true. So what we're also looking at is giving economic power back to the farmer by, or the producer by having them manage much more of their inventory, and that's really important. Joel's here today, and um, he's a great bloke. G'day, Joel. <laughs> and his family have been at the forefront of innovation as far as low-cost structures that continually on the move. Other people would have been innovative in this space are people like Temple Grandin who have really helped us have insight into how to, how to manage animals with much lower stress because ultimately most producers, of, uh, most uh, livestock producers are very, very caring about their livestock and uh, she's really helped with that. So fencing systems are great, um, especially as we are now. Um, as Alan alluded to before, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stone. Um, what we discovered was fire and we could burn stone and make steel. Then a, then a smart guy in New Zealand um, started to play with electricity and ran that through, through steel, such that we can now have, like at Polyface, a single wire holding back something like a pig or 50 pigs. That's never been done before, it's pretty amazing. Or having thousands of animals where the, most, where the thing that they're most petrified of, apart from in Zimbabwe, um, of is a single electric wire. Right? So it's, it's a really amazing time because again, we can, start to mimic the, we can start to mimic the migratory patterns of herding livestock like we never have been able to do before when we were back in the Stone Age. We can do this in ways that harmonise the landscape as well so that we can start to subdivide our landscape in much more effective ways and so on. Now, soils are life but life may die and soils have, uh, don't last for very long if we don't look after them and there's some simple reasons for that and as most of us will be aware here, the power of grass as sort of plant version two in it's so much more efficient at photosynthesis than than trees are, and that it gives so much of its 
its photosynthesis out as polysaccharides into the soil, that it really regenerates soils very, very quickly. And that's just the, if we had a better tool than grasses, well then we'd use it. And so that's a really big focus of ours. And so I'd like to just honour Dr Christine Jones, a fellow Australian, and look at her five essential ingredients for soil formation, if we would. Firstly, we need sunlight, air and water. That's basic, right? Most of us can get that. We also need biologically available minerals. We also need Elaine. Where are you, Elaine? <laughs> she's just one, uh, well, I think she's a living organism. Oop, I'm going the wrong way. We need uh, living things in the soil. And that's been, uh, thank you, Elaine, for all of your insights. She's here and going to help us over the next couple of days. But we need a lot of living in organisms in the soil. That's something that's really happened, uh, that's really gone down. Um, we also need living things on the soil to actually process. This looked like a trophic pyramid to you. Interestingly, our daughter Isabella, when she came home with a year 10 biology book, um, Australian textbook, same book I had when I was that age, and I went straight to the trophic levels and still now it starts at the producer level, uh, sorry, at the uh, grass level and the plant level. There's still no acknowledgement in biological text that the soil even exists. I mean, biology doesn't even have an axe to grind with the soil, <laughs> unlike, unlike agriculture. So, mosaic disturbance regimes are another thing that we have. Now, that we, that we need to have, because these systems are always on the move. Now, I'm getting the wind up seriously from Chris, like he's cutting my head off. Um, I just need to acknowledge in this space, in soils, that in Australia, we have an organisation called Soils for Life, which is very much working in this space, founded by um, our former governor, one of our former governor generals, uh, Michael Jeffrey. And they're doing a fantastic job around Australia, as so many other people are doing, to highlight all of the initiatives that we have going on, because there are a number of people. We think there's about five or 6,000 out of the 140,000 farms in Australia who are practicing what we might call regenerative agriculture, and they need to be championed. Their, their stories need to be told, and so on. So these guys are doing a great job with that. I'm gonna bolt through here, just so that we get her wrapped. So economy is the next thing. And we're in a fantastic space with the web to be able to get online. Even in the time that I've been talking, you can start a website and get going with selling things off your own farm, So that's a, which is an exciting time. That's never been able to happen before. You can use iPhones connected to, to, to swipe credit cards now, like Guido is here. He's I'm buying a, I'm buying a T-bone and he's swiping my card. And that's, that's the way it should be, you know? We're making it really easy. One of our purposes there is so that we change the terms of trade in agriculture such that farmers can afford to be regenerative because unless they have that capacity, they're just on the gerbil wheel chasing their tail. It makes it very difficult for them. And people, who want, and people want better food. Well, you know, to make better food takes more people on farms. That takes more resources. So we've got to have that. So, and we need more education, as Joel is doing, one of the best programs in the world with their polyface intern system, turning out literally a, a hundreds of people now who are ready to go and are doing fantastic things. I don't think there's any, many recidivist um, polyfaces. <laughs> and so on it goes. So um, I'll just whiz through to the last piece that we have here, and that's energy. That you know, the most, why I've put energy at the bottom of our scale is because the photon of sunlight is the most fleeting thing that we deal with. And, we are, and it can be extraordinarily destructive or it can be extraordinarily useful if only we take advantage of all of the products that it can produce. And it really drives our economy. And, uh, and that ultimately what we want to have is a situation where the bi main byproduct of that is not these smiling assassins, there's a slide that works, there we go, that we have as a benefit of photosynthesis, that we're getting all of this recalcitrant, uh, or currently recalcitrant carbon dioxide in our atmosphere and get it down back where it belongs, which is in the soil as we know. All right, so we have that choice. Which aisle do we go down? Do we go down the aisle of amorphism 
where there's nothing and increasingly nothing? Or do we go past our daughters and our sons who are our marketers, the future, with our food that we produce and get it directly to our consumer? Is that the, is that, is that the way we want to go? And I think that is because what we, what we do have is more consumers than, than producers and they will be the people who change agriculture in our opinion. So thank you very much. So I step down now? Good. That was great. Thank you, Darren. So now I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Patrick Holden. Patrick uh, grew up here in the UK, in London, and then went to my home state of California uh, as a, uh, a young man and was so influenced by the, um, the starting alternative agriculture movement there uh, that when he came back to the UK he decided to, to study biodynamics and uh, alternative regenerative agriculture has been the mission of his whole life. Uh, he stood next to us at the Savory Institute as a, a collaborator, uh, as a friend, and uh, it's a pleasure to announce Patrick Holden. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction and for inviting me to speak to this, uh, this event. Um, I want to pay tribute to the Savory Institute and to the vision that Alan has brought into the world because it seems to me that his ideas are of profound importance. Um, he was speaking last night about us being at the end of um, a chapter of agriculture which has been dominated by chemistry um, and moving in through a transition, hopefully, definitely, uh, to a new chapter which will be all about biology. And I think he's 100% right. That's where we are. We need a new form of thinking to be able to do this, to go through this transition. And at the root of all this, of course, will be soil because the biological fertility of the soil will be the key factor upon which the future health of civilizations will depend. And my talk is about um, my practical work as a farmer in putting some of these principles um, into practice on my farm in West Wales. Um, principles which I think are universally applicable, whatever the climate, the scale, the context, and not just in grassland farming as well, but in arable farming too, and I'll come back to that. But first I would like to say a little bit about my parallel work uh, in the world. I was for many years um, um, involved with it, working for the Soil Association, but in 2010 I stepped down and um, set up a new organisation called the Sustainable Food Trust. Small organisation, our mission is to accelerate the transition um, towards more sustainable food systems working internationally and collaboratively because we're not large enough to be the change or to do the change, except perhaps individually, um, but what we can do hopefully um, is increase the scale of collaboration um, between all the many millions of individuals and thousands of organisations that are already working in the, the, uh, the wider food movement thereby accelerating the change that's needed. Specifically, uh, we are working in three areas. Oops, sorry, it's the wrong way. Um, there we are. No, I'm gonna go back again. I shall just stay with that. Um, our first area is building collaborative partnerships. I've already mentioned that. Our second area, and Alan again was referring to this in his speech, was influencing the economic and policy environment uh, through bringing together the results of research which demonstrates uh, the need for change and uh, that would lead in, eventually to policy change. And uh, one of the areas which we've been focusing on in particular in that area is the issue of the economics of food and farming which at present are distorted in such a way uh, that it is more profitable to farm intensively than it is to farm sustainably. Um, and this is a huge issue, a huge barrier to the changes that I've just described that our organization is in the world uh, to accelerate. 
Um, and we held a big conference in London in December 2013 on the three theme of true cost accounting in food and farming. Um, and in a workshop this afternoon, I'm going to be going into the details of uh, what we talked about there and the outcomes from that event in more detail. Um, the third area is communications, because unless, as Alan also said during his talk, unless we engage with individual citizens, we harness the power of informed public opinion, we're not going to bring about the changes that are needed in the time available. So communications is essential. And I think that there are points in history when accelerate, the conditions are right for accelerated change, and we're probably at one of those tipping point moments where there's a sort of latent intuitive understanding which is in the comes out of the psychic internet, or actually the internet, especially amongst young people who are thirsty and ready for this change. And it's as if when the ideas, Alan's ideas, ideas about changes that they need in agriculture are presented to them, they already know it somehow. We already know the truth of these ideas. And because of the extraordinary vast power of communications, this means that change can be accelerated at greater levels. So in our, the third area of the Sustainable Food Trust's work uh, particularly through our newsletter. We're hoping to get some of these uh, ideas out there more widely. But I think that in the end, change comes from a, very, from a personal understanding. Uh, because if you can't relate to the world as an individual, then you're just lost in the vastness of things. So I believe in the principle of microcosm and macrocosm. If you can understand yourself, then you can understand the bigger picture. So I would like to now move to uh, my personal epiphany which may sound strange to say, but it's sort of come in the last couple of years, but late in life, but perhaps better late than never, um, about soil. Now, you'd think that I would have understood soil really well, because after all, I ran the Soil Association for 15 years, and I've been farming sustainably as I knew how for 41 years. We haven't used any uh, fertilizer, pesticides, all that sort of stuff. But in fact, it took the influence of people that I knew who brought to me a new perspective on soil and on grazing management, literally of, over the last few years, to bring about a change in my thinking. Because it's easy to understand something intellectually, but when it becomes inside you, that's a whole different thing. There's a difference between knowledge and understanding, and I think that's what's happened to me in the last couple of years. So here's the story of my soil epiphany. Uh, a chap called David Wilson, who's the farm manager at, at Highgrove Farm, mentioned to me about two or three years ago that you should understand the soil as like the stomach of the plant. Because plants don't have stomachs, they have a sort of exogenous stomach, which is the soil, with which they have an extraordinary relationship, because about a third of their metabolic energy is spent exuding sugary sap into the root zone, which nourishes a symbiotic community of bacteria and fungi, mycorrhizal associations, I'm sure most of you know about much of this stuff, upon which the nutrition of the plant depends because the plant is incapable of break, breaking down humus on its own. It relies on this symbiosis between uh, the fungi and, and the bacteria to do so. So that rang a bell, but still I didn't quite get it. And then I heard a couple of years ago in Iowa, in Des Moines, at a conference organized by Big Ag, actually, uh, at which the head of public health for the state of Iowa spoke. And she spoke about the human biome and about how there are more organisms in our own bodies than there are cells. And they are not just in us, in our stomachs mainly, of course, but they are playing a vital role on a daily basis in nourishing us. And she gave a rather graphic example of this. She was saying how across America, but of course it's across the world, um, people are experiencing, health authorities and um, doctors are experiencing a rise in untreatable cases of uh, diarrhea. And in the state of Iowa, they're finding that this diarrhea was not responding to the most potent antibiotics. We all know about that, of course. And antibiotics is an interesting word. The clue's in the name. <laughs> Um, antibiotics wipe out our stomach flora, amongst other things. But they have found that by using fecal implants, uh, mainly from between the spouses to make it slightly more acceptable, um, 
they are getting an 80% recovery. They were getting an 80% recovery of otherwise untreatable cases of diarrhea. And it was this insight that she shared with me that suddenly enabled me to understand the relationship between myself and my own soil on my farm, because I saw that it's in fact personal. My soil, my stomach soil, is full of bacteria, and I cultivate them by eating. So I eat good food, and the bacteria, the biome of my own stomach, mobilizes to digest the food, and upon the health and the quality of that digestion, I am healthy, or, and hopefully productive, or otherwise. And, exact, and in exactly the same way, on my farm, because I'm playing a sort of catalytic role as a soil steward, I can increase the biological fertility of my own farm by my various interventions, the application of farmyard manures, grazing management, I'll come back to that, um, structure, uh, all the things that farmers do. And if I get it right, then I will increase the soil organic matter and the biology and the complexity and the softness of my soil. And the result will be my plants will be healthier, my cows will be healthier, and my soils will lock up carbon and all the things that Darren has just been saying. And only good will come of that. And in fact, unless I get better at doing that, I'm going to stay where I am. And I've realized just in the last couple of years that the combination of recognizing that I have this vital catalytic role in improving the soil, the soil of my own farm, um, and that if I do it right, which does involve infrastructure, as again Darren has just been saying, uh, I can dramatically increase the productivity of my pastures. I've realized that I'm not at the end of my chapter of farming, I'm at the beginning. Um, and I think that over the next few years, as long as God spares me, uh, we can take our productivity at the farm in Wales to another level by the application of some of these principles, including and especially uh, holistic grazing management. So again, the second element of my epiphany, I'd known about Alan Savory's work, I'd heard about holistic grazing management, I put it into practice to a degree, but now I've become more organized in doing that. And now, if I can make this work, um, I'm going to talk about my farm. So it's, the, it's now, it happens to be, the longest established organic dairy herd in Wales. You could say that's important. It isn't really important, actually. It's just that I've been at it a long time, but I've been a slow learner, and now I'm at the beginning of a new chapter. Uh, I farm 300 acres, more or less. It depends on which area of land I'm including that I rent. We milk 85 Ayrshire cows. We have around 60 uh, young stock and beef crosses. Uh, we have an on-farm cheese making operation where we make a single farm cheddar style cheese. Um, that's that. And there, here are our objectives for the future of our farming. We want to increase our system's resilience, obviously, as in the ways that I've just been describing, to improve our soil biology, that's the key, to practice holistic grazing management, to produce renewable energy. We're already doing ground source heat pump and solar PV. Um, we're putting in an anaerobic digester this year, and we want to do a wind, small wind turbine as well. So we're on a sort of journey there. Nutrient recycling, we've been bad at that. We're going to get better because we're increasing our storage. We want to do more composting. Moving towards self-sufficiency in cattle feed, we grow oats and peas, and we feed that to the cows. We mill and mix, mix it and feed it directly to the cows in the milking parlor. And we want to develop the cultural and social uh, dimension, as was just said again by Darren and Joel and others are doing that brilliantly. So those are, that's what we're trying to do. And now we've got to the wrong end. That's my family. You know, we've got, we're at the right end here. That's my family. Actually, taken a couple of years ago, because since then, we've redone the parlor. Um, here's our herd. This is, these were taken this year, all with my iPhone 5. Uh, sorry about the quality. What can you do? This was taken last week. Uh, very interesting how, how cattle behave in a sort of collective organism way. They, they behave as a, a group of animals that are more than the sum of their parts, and you can see that when they're all together. This is getting the cows in to be milked. Uh, this is what we've done. We've put in a mile of tracks uh, using stone from our hill. Oh, I should say we're farming at uh, 239 meters above sea level. 780 feet, uh, we have about 60 inches of rain. The rain is a problem because we have to be very, very careful not to damage the soils, which are fragile and quite vulnerable. 
So we've put in all this infrastructure, water troughs, tracks, and electric fencing. Dar um, Darren's been mentioning that. There it all is. This, is. this has come as a result of my epiphany. And here's our water troughs. Five cows drinking their water is key. I agree with what he said about plastic. It's extraordinary what you can do because you have to, if you're going to practice holistic grazing management, you have to get the water to the cows, essential. And here's our clover pastures. Our practice is to aim towards grazing cows for 12 hours and giving them fresh grass every 12 hours. Um, our return rotation, of course, varies, and some fields, the wetter fields on the farm, uh, we avoid in wet weather. So there's a, a flexibility, of course, of this holistic grazing system. Here is the before and after. Note the dandelions. Uh, all pastures tell their own, the plants are telling the story about what's in the soil. So you just need to read your soil by seeing what plants are in it and respond in your management practices accordingly. Dandelions, there's another indicator. We can talk about what that means, but that was taken in, I think it was in May this year. No, April. Uh, white clover lay, bit dominant in clover. Uh, red clover, white clover, silage, uh, mown, etc. See the landscape there. This is our oats and peas. This is drilling the spring. Here they are coming up. See there's about 20% peas in the crop. They say that it feeds better than it analyzes. So there's alchemy going on there somehow. And here it is coming. This is two years ago, harvested. There's our bedding. We're self-sufficient in bedding. That's another element of resilience. So you grow your own grain, you feed it to the cows, and the straw is what we bed the cows on in the winter. And we also do rush hay. Here's another wonderful ancient farm track. This is one we didn't put in. It was already there when the farm came with the farm 41 years ago. But we're increasing that now. There's me in the milking parlor quite recently. And there's my son, Ben. Got him milking, child labor, very important. Didn't, didn't pay him. <laughs> he is happy, really. Uh, here's my, an older son, Sam, and his wife, Rachel. Uh, this is our cheese dairy. We're now putting about five-sixths of all the milk we produce into uh, Havel cheese. Here is our new uh, slurry store, which is going to have a roof and become an anaerobic digester, uh, which will add to our energy self-sufficiency work in progress. We hope to have it in by October. And here is our latest machine with uh, two of my other sons, uh, Harry and James, um, a very important element of increasing farm flexibility. Maybe we'll run it on methane one day. And here is our pond. And interesting that this was only done last year, February last year, and it's extraordinary the resilience of nature. Look at all those seeds that were just there waiting to come up. And here is a farm walk that we had for our 40th anniversary last year. Uh, it seems to me, as Darren also said, that if we're going to uh, move forward in farming, it's all about people and the cultural and social dimension. So that's my farm story. Now I'm going to go back to some thoughts which are related to what I said um, about the communications agenda. It's interesting, and I think, am I, am I okay now? I've got a few more minutes. Um, it's interesting to reflect on how much appetite there is and interest in the issues, these issues, because they touch everyone very personally, as I've been describing. And uh, on the Sustainable Food Trust website, we also have a weekly newsletter. My colleague Richard Young, uh, who is well known for his amazing work on the misuse of antibiotics in intensive livestock systems, recently um, posted um, a two and a half thousand word reflective piece on the role of ruminant animals and their importance in the future of food systems. And there's recently been an announcement by a coalition called the Eating Better Coalition, a coalition of many of the leading NGOs in this country, who are basically saying, it's or a la mode now, eat less meat. And in the mood music of this, which is you could say, well, it's obvious that if we're going to feed 9 billion in a sustainable way, we're going to have to eat less meat. But I think that in this announcement, there's a real risk that the um, grass-fed, sustainable ruminant baby, 
is being thrown out with the bathwater of the negative mood music about eating me less meat overall. So Richard Young, in his incredibly polite way, uh, challenged the orthodoxy, the new orthodoxy of eating less meat. And by the way, red meat's particularly bad because of the emissions and because of the health impacts. And basically quietly suggested that if it, when it came to ruminant uh, meat, which was mainly or exclusively forage fed, that ruminants are not only important, they're central. And that if we fast forward to the future of truly sustainable agriculture, ruminants will play a central role, not only in managing our environment and converting the forage during the fertility building phases of rotations into something that farmers can sell and make money from, but also in promoting public health, because the ratio of omega-3 and omega-6 fats in, in pasture-fed beef is actually really healthy, whereas if you look at intensive chicken, it's really unhealthy. So this is profoundly orthodoxy challenging. But what is really fascinating it is, is that it has stimulated the most vigorous debate and the most traffic that we've had yet since we, formed the, which, since we launched the Sustainable Food Trust website and newsletter. And this is an ongoing thing. Uh, there's, that Richard's involved in a very fascinating dialogue with some of the people who are involved with the Eating Better Coalition. But I believe that uh, we have to address these vital issues, even if uh, you know, we're about collaboration, but part of the collaboration must be to operate with other organizations in the, in, in the NGO field, including the environmentalists and the conservationists and the public health organizations, who historically have not been talking to each other, and challenge orthodoxies if we need to, but always in a friendly spirit. So I'm suggesting that this uh, example of what we've provoked is a huge cause for hope because there is a massive interest in this. People are very confused at the moment out there in the world. They don't know what to do. They don't know what the right thing to do is in terms of what to eat. And they need guidance. And this is a perfect example of where we need to navigate. We need to suggest to people that if they want to be part of the sustainable solution, they need to adjust their diets to the output of truly sustainable farming systems. And systems of production based on holistic grazing management, both in permanent pastures, but also in the fertility building phases of arable rotations, which will in the future have to change from being all arable continuously and umbilically addicted to nitrogen fertilizer to obtaining their nitrogen through legumes and grass, grown maybe for three or four years in the regenerative phase of the rotation, and people need to eat that meat. So we need to take the public on a journey of understanding and they want this because people need to feel that they're connected to the solution in a very personal way. So I'll end my talk on that note, but I think there is great cause for optimism at the moment. We just need to be honest with people, tell them our stories, make them personal and help them to take the right action to become a, the part of the solution that even if they live in an urban context, which I did, I grew up in London, they can actually still relate to. Thank you very much. Am I hot? We're going to do a panel with the uh, producers now. So if we get the producers to come up on stage, that would be great. And then do we have a hand to take this down? The AV guys, we're going to do that. And then could you help us take the podium down? All right, so this is a panel on uh, producers from all over the world and all different sizes. So we're going we're gonna to start here, and uh, I'm going to let them introduce themselves, and so we're just going to go right down the line. We'll start with Pablo here. Okay. Um, so let's go.
Hello, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here. I'm Pablo Borelli uh, from Argentina, from Patagonia. And we uh, speak on behalf of a network, of a collaborative network of uh, 60 farmers that are working together uh, trying to regenerate Patagonian grasslands uh, and using holistic management as the main regenerative tool. So i um, very pleased to be here. The, the, the things are gain, gaining momentum uh, by the really amazing success of, uh, of the, the, when the land is uh, managed properly and cared properly. So uh, uh, we are working with these farmers. We have a, a, a group of grassland professionals and educators and that have made the training and are accredited on the Savory Institute. And now uh, we run, as uh, the network, we have the, the Argentine hub for the Savory, for the global network of grassland restoration. And our partners from Chile, which are here, are running the hub for, for the country. So uh, we are trying to do our best to promote uh, the recovery of, of the grasslands of Patagonia. Do you mind sharing about how many acres you've impacted? Yes, we are, uh, at the moment, we are impacting uh, 2.5 million acres uh, each year and growing. All right, Jim, if you could introduce yourself. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Chris. I'm Jim Howell. Um, I lead the, um, our company called Grasslands, which is the land management arm of the Savory Institute. Um, we initiated Grasslands basically simultaneously with the Savory Institute uh, several years ago. Uh, we, our, our purpose with Grasslands is to, is to um, associate ourselves with like-minded investors, um, find uh, really compelling uh, grazing agricultural properties, uh, f facilitate getting those properties purchased, and then we engage in long-term management contracts on those on those ranches that we're able to that we're able to acquire. Um, we meaning grasslands. We 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 provide a, a, a turnkey management service, do everything for the land-owning investor. Um, so we've been super fortunate in that we've been able to find several like-minded investors that have trusted us and um, dove in with us. Uh, we were able to get our first properties bought in early 2010, and uh, today we've got two ranches in South Dakota, uh, two in eastern Montana, so that's our northern Great Plains uh, area, and we manage a ranch on Maui in Hawaii, um, and we manage a high country uh, station in, in New Zealand. And so we've, uh, we've put together about 200,000 acres now that we're managing carrying about uh, right now in the summer when we have all our Northern Great Plains ranches stocked with uh, yearling cattle. We're carrying about a little over 13,000 head of cattle right now. Um, in New Zealand, we also have about 20,000 sheep. And we, we grow out dairy replacement heifers on the New Zealand property uh, on contract for the owners of those dairy heifers. We grow them out till they calve for the first time and start lactating. And we'll grow out about 6,000 of those this year in New Zealand. And we also farm a few, a few red deer in New Zealand, uh, European red deer, about 600 of those. So that's the scope of our, of our asset center management. We, we have about 17 people that are full-time staff between all of those properties, and we have an administrative office in Bozeman, Montana, with uh, three people there. So that's our, that's our whole under management with grasslands. Thank you, Jim. All right, Brittany. Hi, my name is Brittany Cole Bush. I'm a self-deemed modern-day shepherdess. I'm a project manager for a contract grazing outfit as well as a meat enterprise in the greater Bay Area of San Francisco in California. Um, we have about 1,600 head of sheep and goats that are for hire six months out of the year. We graze uh, for hire about 500 acres, about four herds of between 450 and 500 animals per herd. Uh, we, our team is, consists of about five people. I, I'm project manager. We have a logistics manager. We have the uh, owner as administration. We have uh, uh, Peruvian herders that come to the states on special uh, H-2A work contracts, as well as a dozen border collies and another half dozen uh, Great Pyrenees Anatolian guard dogs. Uh, so that's our work staff. 
<laughs> and, and Mimi. <laughs> My name is Mimi Hetlenbrand, and I own and run the 777 Bison Ranch in South Dakota. We're in western South Dakota, and we run about 1,500 head of American bison on about 30,000 acres of short grass prairie. We've been practicing holistic management now for over 30 years, and I have to say, with our planned grazing, we have increased our biodiversity and our animals look great. <laughs> anyway, um, we're in the process right now of increasing our herd even more. We figure we can run at least 2,000 head on our 30,000 acres. And um, I have two other fine gentlemen that I work with, and um, that's my story. <laughs> right, thank you. So, uh, Pablo, I'll start with you. Um, you know, obviously, animals, we talk a lot about meat as, as their main product, but there's a whole slew of other products available as well. Wool, dairy, leather, uh, bones. How can a large-scale operation make sure they're taking full advantage of the value of the animal and use, utilize niche products even on scale? Well, we, we focus on, in our network to, uh, on a process of differentiation we, we brand, uh, we get into the wool market uh, with a brand for sustainable wool in a, in a joint project with uh, the Nature Conservancy and Patagonia Inc. And we are supplying uh, sustainable wool uh, to, to those brands, to Stella McCartney, and with uh, premium prices for those. So we're trying to capture the, the added value of uh, regenerative work. So I think there is a, a, a very important role of consumers in, uh, in send the right signals to the farmers of what, what is good for the society and what is good for the land. And uh, so the market can drive changes by, by putting premiums on, on, the, uh, on the products that come from regenerative management. But behind that, you need uh, a branding process, but also a quality assurance process to, to, to differentiate what you're doing from greenwashing. So uh, it needs to come from the land. It's not from a marketing program. Right. All right, Mimi, um, you know, beef, pork, and chicken are kind of the, the main staples of, of most protein in, in, in many uh, diets around the world. What's it like, what are the challenges and opportunities to market bison uh, in the U.S.? And, and maybe speak a little bit also of challenges of getting to market being in a rural area uh, and, and trying to get product to, uh, to consumers. Bison will never compete with, with cattle. There's only, in all of North America, there's only 500,000 bison, commercial, commercial animals. So we, we know that we are a niche market and that's a challenge for us. We have several small producers. It's how do we get those producers together to work together? We're lucky that we have the National Bison Association, which has done a lot of marketing for us. And the information's there, it's just how do we reach the small producers who need to get their product out there? Um, what was the other question? <laughs> Uh, product to market, and then uh, the challenges of, of bison. Some of these smaller producers live in the middle of nowhere, and we're lucky enough in South Dakota to have a mobile processing plant which reaches reservations and places of remoteness. That helps us. Um, networking is another huge thing that um, the producers in the industry are doing right now. I personally work with a large producer in Wisconsin who has similar ethics that I do, and they actually will send trucks to pick up animals for us. Um, it's all about networking and working with your national organization or local organizations. Thank you. All right, Brittany, uh, you, know, you sit on the fringe of some of the most you know, densely populated land in the world, for certain America. Uh, where do you see opportunities to build bridges with urban dwellers uh, in the work you do with your contract, contract raising? I feel that we sit in a really incredible and important place because we have the interface 
with urban folks who don't uh, have exposure to livestock. This opportunity in grazing in public lands uh, that are spaces for recreation for the urban uh, folk provides an incredible amount of opportunity for education, for discussion about why are these animals on these public lands? And, in for, and for the case of what we do, we do fire hazard reduction and, and grazing fuel breaks as well as special vegetation management projects trying to reinvigorate grasslands as well as reduce invasive species and undesirable uh, populations. So uh, being on the urban periphery allows for uh, these discussions that normally wouldn't take place. And quite frankly, a lot of people that ask me questions when I'm, I'm out there on the ground, is that a sheep or is that a goat? I was like, well, that's a good question. There's actually sheep and goats. So we actually mix, we have mixed species uh, herds. So uh, the conversation piece is so important, the education, as well as the discussion of where food comes from. Uh, sheep and goat meat is actually uh, becoming more and more and more popular outside of the ethnic communities that we generally see sheep and goat meat being eaten in the urban areas. And so there's a, there's a new wave of sheep and goat meat trending uh, with demographics. Uh, in, in my experience, um, both working in an urban area as well as living in an urban area. And I like the conversation to be had about these living creatures that are providing a service uh, in the parks that, that urbanites recreate, uh, they can also be eating them. <laughs> now that story sounds a little bit morbid, but we need to, to be responsible consumers and know what we're eating. And I think that, uh, you know, again, uh, those conversations need to be had and having livestock and present uh, with urban folk is, is an is amazing opportunity. That's fantastic. So Jim, you know, what you're doing with grasslands is amazing. Uh, what advice would you give to producers looking to find land that fits their economic model? Well, it, de it depends on, on your economic model and your specific local context. The answers are probably infinite to that, but, but um, you know, Brittany's, what, she's got opportunities that she's accessing based on her environment and her context and what's going on right there. But I would say that as, as you go around the world, you see abandoned or underutilized or underappreciated patches of grass everywhere. And, um, and so, it, it, you know, so there's a lot of creative businesses like what Brittany's doing that can, that can figure out models that are appropriate to the specific space to tap into that underutilized resource that's good for everything. And so, um, you know, we did that on our, my family's ranch in western Colorado for years. We just happened to have a neighbor next to us who, um, who, who was very into hunting elk. He didn't need an economic return from that property, but he wanted it managed in a, um, in a, in a regenerative way and it, to enhance it for elk habitat. We figured out a collaboration there, vastly expanded our resource base. That, that was, that's what worked for us in that context. So it was, it, was a, it was a process of communication and figuring out how to tap into potential there that you wouldn't have if you didn't kind of open your mind up a little bit and look for those, look for those unrealized opportunities. With grasslands, we're, or, you know, the context there is where we have investors who are seeking a competitive economic return on that land investment. So that means that land has to meet certain criteria. Um, the main thing is you have to have scale. It, it's hard to make these commercial ranches work without a certain level of scale, a certain carrying capacity, certain stocking rate. Um, and then to the extent that you can have what I call the elements of easy incorporated into those operations, that helps a lot. Ranching, you know, livestock agriculture is tough business no matter what. So to the extent you can set up something that has some advantages, <laughs> it helps things out. So some of those are simple things like it's a lot easier to ranch on a flat landscape than it is on a really steep landscape. Right. It's been a lot of energy fighting gravity ranching in mountains. And, um, so that's, that's an element of easy, relatively flat. Another one is relative productivity. Um, it's hard to make something work that's you know, one, one cow to the square mile section stocking rate because you have so much space, so many roads, so much fence to maintain per animal unit. So it's, it's just tough to make that work. So to the extent you, can, you, can, you, you have a, a relatively high stocking rate um, over which to spread overheads that you have no matter what, that you, that's, that's an element of easy. Um, you have to have reasonably good surface water, ideally, or fairly shallow, high-quality groundwater, um, good roads, 
Um, if you're in the custom grazing market, you need to have cattle or sheep in that environment <laughs> and therefore have customers. Right. So, so all those things need to come together and, uh, and the price of land has to be right um, if you're investing in land. So it's not easy to find all those things overlapping and meshing in a specific area. The, re the reasons that we're ranching in, specifically the Northern Great Plains and New Zealand, do offer those, those various factors and variables do come together to create economically viable investments for investors. It's funny, as we, as we travel around the world, um, it seems like everywhere we go that it's the same issue that you know, the, the current generation of farmers is, is aging and there are becoming increased opportunities to find underutilized land. So um, that's good insight on going through the decision-making framework to find what, what makes sense for you. Mm -hmm. um, so Pablo, uh, I know you guys have done some really cool stuff with your genetics. Explain how uh, improving genetics can be used as a tool uh, to help someone realize their holistic context. Okay, well, in, in Patagonia, the place we are, the sheep production is almost a monoculture. And, uh, and despite, uh, we are trying to, uh, to avoid that concept because it's, uh, it's, it's wrong. But uh, in, in fact, uh, it's, it's a great monoculture of sheep. So um, we are working, thinking of it holistically, we need to, to regenerate the land to be able to hold higher stocking rates because high stocking rate is the main dri driver for profit. And the second thing is what you get for every sheep you have because operational costs are the same for, yeah, for medical sheep or good sheep. So we introduced the uh, multipurpose merinos from Australia in a partnership from, uh, with uh, Australian partners. And that type of animal, which is very rustic, very similar to the primitive sheep in terms of uh, the shape of the body and the, the, the way they behave, well, the, that type of sheep is performing uh, outstanding in Patagonia. And so the combination of holistic <coughs> management and MPMs and multipurpose mer merinos has allowed us to double the income of the farmers in, in, in a five, five to six year period. And that's the most amazing uh, package that we have ever had uh, in, for a long time in Patagonia. We never had available such a, a high impact uh, combination of, uh, of decision making. And, uh, it's, and it, all the technology is change your mind. It, it's not a high tech approach. Right. So just so that, that, uh, that, that we all understand it correctly, you're saying the focus is about production first and the land first and then on genetics second. Because a lot of people get hung up on that genetics question. And, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, no. It plays Just a, it plays a role, but it's not the only one. Yeah, fix the land first yeah. and get that right first. And then if you combine that simultaneously with better decisions on the genetics, thinking of functionality of the animal and fitness to the environment and what the market is asking and all the biological principles that you can apply, well, you can get a great result. Yeah. All right, Brittany, what, uh, what suggestions would you offer other young people in, in breaking into agriculture? Oh, that's an exciting one. <laughs> uh, being fearless, brave, and bold. Do not be afraid to make mistakes because that is the way we learn. Uh, create relationships with mentors. Learn the tradition and the past of way things have been done and be uh, exploratory and in investigating new innovative ideas and approaches. Uh, we must be adaptive and we bring that to the next generation of agrarians. I also believe that we hold responsibility uh, to redefine and create more respect for uh, what it means to be a rancher or a farmer. And uh, we can bring some diversity of of, of uh, ethnicity, of gender, of backgrounds. I'm from, I'm from the suburbs of Southern California, first, first generation uh, rancher, and I'm sure I have some agrarian in me uh, from the past, but um, I am so encouraging of uh, fellow young folks to get involved. And for those of you who are past the Greenhorn uh, era, I would suggest supporting young folks uh, getting into this because we're going to need support, we're going to need mentor mentorship, and we're going to need a force behind us to do this good work 
with the challenges that we have at hand. So uh, my, my biggest uh, suggestion is for young people to be extremely enthusiastic and do not be afraid because we, we must not show any fear moving forward. <laughs> That's good advice. Good That's a good advice. So, uh, Mimi, with uh, you know, 30 years of, of management with holistic, uh, or with experience with the holistic plan grazing, what, uh, what gives you the most hope for the future? People like Brittany. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's so encouraging to see young people really out there grasping it and wanting and being passionate about it. Um, yeah. For me, it's wonderful to see somebody is passionate like you. And I've seen it in other people who have come out to see my bison and see what we have done. And it's so nice to see an, an, aware, an awareness increasing and consciousness about where our food comes from and how it's raised. And I can't tell you how many people come out to, to my, my ranch and really appreciate all the care that we put into the land and to our animals. And, and they go out and tell somebody else the same thing, what we're doing and how wonderful it is. And we have reached a lot of people, and I have to say, increased consciousness, enthusiastic young people. I, that's, that's the future. Thank you. All right. So, Jim, I think we're going to close on this question here. How important do you think the next 15 years is for humankind? And cool. what role do agriculturalists <laughs> play in that? <laughs> Uh, well, if, uh, if you believe what the climate scientists are telling us, we're, we're, we're uh, pretty much down to crunch time. And, um, you know, we're at uh, four, about 400 uh, parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere right now. And the clim climate scientists are telling us that if we get to 450, we're likely to pat, we're, we're getting to be fairly highly likely to pass certain tipping points that are going to lead to catastrophic, irreversible climate change that will that will eliminate the possibility for us to continue our current human civilization. So, and we're at 400 to 450, you might say, when are we gonna to get to 450? Well, we're increasing CO2 in the atmosphere at a rate of about two parts per million per year, a little over two per year. So we're only 20 years away from that. And um, so, uh, and, it, and it's possible that we already have crossed over these tipping points, but we all have to believe we haven't. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, that, Stopping and not, not crossing that threshold, which is sort of inconceivable right now how we're not going to do that, but assume that we can at least slow down and maybe go past a little bit, that's going to, the main, the main, the main uh, means by which we're going to do that is simply by stopping the, the bleeding and stopping the combustion of fossil fuels that are buried deep in the earth and stopping the volatilization of soil organic matter out of the soil. Um, so that's stopping the bleeding, but then getting our climate back to a stable state, back to under 400 parts per million, back to 300 parts per million, which is where it should be, is going to be a long process of re-engaging with our landscapes, um, with human beings as the keystone species at the end of the day, making all that happen. That's not, a, that's not meant to be a comment on our wonderful capacity as humans. It's a realistic comment stating that we got to be the positive, regenerative keystone species, because that's our only hope to survive as a species. We have to say, we're the ones that are going to make it happen. Um, as you know, it's crazy that we're a, a, an organism that is the main geological force on this planet. So we are. So we have, to, we have to reverse that, and we're the only ones that can do it. So over the next 15 years, we have to make absolutely enormous change in, 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 in stopping the bleeding. And then we need to engender this, this new culture, this re-agrarianism, getting people back on the land and, and being that keystone species, caressing those landscapes uh, so that carbon is, is coming back into our soils and back into this fantastic diversity of life. Thank you. So with that, we're going we're gonna to close the session. I'll let the, uh, the panelists go back down to the audience. And then uh, it's time for lunch. And so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have lunch served out here. Matt, do we have lunch in both? Uh, where do you go? Do we, have we do have lunch on both sides. So yeah, so foyer B and foyer A both have lunch options for you. So um, go ahead and enjoy. And then we're going to start back promptly at 1 o'clock in here. <laughs>